Kia ora tātou katoa, nā mihi nui ki a koutou, ko Dean Lawrence Ahou. Uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome you all here to the Transitional Cathedral, uh, the cathedral we call the Broad Tent with a Wide Open Door, and to the seminar being offered in collaboration with Theology House, which is um, directed by Gareth Bazet, who's right over here. Uh, so Gareth and I have been collaborating to put this on uh, Gareth is responsible for theological education in the Anglican Diocese of Christchurch. It's a great pleasure indeed to welcome our honoured guests and presenters. Our chair this evening is Megan Nichol, welcome to you, who is the General Manager in uh, Communications and People at Antarctica, New Zealand. Uh, Dr Victoria Metcalf, who's behind me, uh, the Royal Society Te Aparangi Marine Biology. Uh, Rod Oram, a fairly well-known journalist and author, He's over here. Yep. Uh, the Associate Professor Crucial Watani from Massey University, welcome to you. Uh, Professor John Cottle, Chief Science Advisor, Antarctica, New Zealand, a very warm welcome to you. Dr. Uh, Emily Colgan from Trinity Theological College in Auckland, and Professor Tim Nash, the Antarctic Research Centre, Victoria University, of Wellington and Programme Leader, Ice, Ocean, Atmosphere, Antarctic Science Programme. Welcome to Tim. Yes. Fantastic to have you all here. It's great to have David Kennedy as well, Chief Executive of Antarctica New Zealand. Welcome to you. Um, it's a pleasure to welcome all who've gathered here tonight for this seminar. I'd like to extend a warm welcome to those who are joining us on the live stream and also to the listeners of Plains FM who are broadcasting this event from here. Welcome to you all. We are an Anglican Cathedral, this is a house of prayer, we've just had our evensong, but it's also a place where we gather for respectful debate, where we can be educated and have our mind expanded, and where we can learn and dialogue together as we think about the direction our society is heading and the kind of society we want to become in the future. Uh, I'd like to bring you greetings from our Bishop, Peter Carroll. Um, he's an apology for lateness, but will be here in due course. Uh, in terms of health and safety, um, toilets are actually in a separate building just out through the side door, just pop through one of those exits, they're out there. Um, I don't think there are any children here, but if you are bringing children, make sure that children are accompanied when they go to the toilets because the loos are public. Uh, fire and sort of general gathering place is the lawn that way, um, and all these exits doors, I might just make a note of where they are in case we have to leave rapidly for some unknown reason. And if there's an earthquake, we just drop, cover and hold. So without further ado, further ado, I will hand over now to Megan, our chair, and um, welcome to you. Thank you. Kia ora koutou, ko Firth of Forth, toku waka, ko Kashmir Hills, oku maunga, ko Heathkit, Toku awa, uh, no Otai Tahiaho, no Te Tirio Te Moana Aotearoa Toku Mahi, called Megan Nicol Aho. So I am, uh, was born in Christchurch, um, over near Kashmir Hills, is sort of where I was brought up, although I live in Lincoln now, and I work for Antarctica New Zealand, and it is my pleasure to be here and, um, and chair the panel here tonight. Um, Lawrence um, stole some of my thunder because I was going to introduce everyone, but he's done that. Thanks, Lawrence. And also tell you where the toilets are, and he's done that too. If you could use um, that door over there, though, just for the live streaming, it makes it a bit easier. That would be great. Um, so tonight we are looking at, for the beauty of the earth, we're learning from Antarctica to protect our natural world. Um, it's hosted here, obviously, by the Transitional Cathedral, thank you very much, and also um, by um, in collaboration with Theology House. And it is for the people, so for you, thank you very much for coming along. We're quite a small, intimate group. I've been trying to get everyone to come in close. Um, we, um, it's nice to have everyone in close for the speakers. Antarctica is the coldest, highest, driest, windiest, most remote continent on Earth. Um, it's int intimately connected with the rest of the world and the world that we live in via the global climate system. Everything we do affects Antarctica and vice versa, everything that happens in Antarctica ultimately will affect us as well. So we've got some incredible people here tonight who can share their knowledge and experience with us and give us a bit more of an idea about what that actually means. Um, this evening is part of a, a wider um, 
uh, celebration of Antarctica and um, Christchurch's gateway status. We are one of five cities throughout the world, the only five, where um, people fly down or head down to Antarctica. Um, so if you want to go to Days of Ice through the Christchurch New Zealand website, then you'll find all the other events, and there are many throughout the week. There's still plenty um, right up until the rest of the week. And of course, Sunday is um, our beloved church service where we, um, at 10 o'clock, we have an incredible service here where we um, bless everyone that's heading down to Antarctica for the season, uh, which has, has just started. So um, we look forward to that too. Um, each of our presenters tonight will present for seven minutes and then there will be a panel discussion and then at the end there will be some Q&A. So if you have any questions then please do um, um, think them up as they're talking because we would love to answer them. Try and trick them up, that would be great. See if they can actually answer them, especially him because I work with him. I'll report back. Um, so it is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker tonight. Um, Victoria Metcalf, Dr. Victoria Metcalf. I'm sorry, Vic, I don't, I don't stand on ceremony very often. So everyone tonight will get their, um, you know, their doctor or their professor or whatever said once, and then after that, it's nicknames. Okay. So, Dr. Victoria Metcalf, known um, by me as Vic, um, is a marine biologist and science communicator, and she's committed to making a difference. She has had many trips to Antarctica. I think is it ten years? You study for? Yeah. So over ten, over, over more than that. So. Um, more than a decade, Vic um, went down to Antarctica and researched environmental change, change impacts on Antarctic fish and shellfish. Um, her previous role in the Office of the Prime Minister's Chief Science Advisor, um, she was National Coordinator of the Participatory participatory science platform where communities, educators and scientists received funding to work together on locally meaningful projects. Um, she found it very rewarding and it matches her passion for engaging the public with science. Um, now, Vic is a strategic relationships advisor for the Royal Society. She's a steadfast advocate for women in STEM, which is science, technology, engineering and maths. Um, and she balance, balances all of this incredibly well, and I don't know how she does it, um, as she's also a single mother to a very busy, curious and gorgeous 10-year-old daughter, Brie. Um, with Brie, she explores the world around her and um, often on bike and foot. And um, I, I know Vic well, because we went to school together about five years ago. Um, so um, Vic, Vic is here to discuss uh, the tip of the iceberg, what lies below, what lies beyond. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Victoria Metcalf. Kira Koto, ko Victoria Metcalf, aho. Um, Megan for that introduction, she is right, we did go to uh, school together and it was only last, last year, five years ago, sometime like that. Um, now the maths is not going to quite stack up because way back in 1999 I first stood on Antarctic soil, uh, well thousands of years of frozen penguin poo to be precise, uh, and it's hard to relay the impression that that first moment on Antarctic penguin poo had on me, uh, but it was epiphanous and it was the most majestic vista I had ever looked out at and I had many cacophonous penguins surrounding me and at that point I decided to make Antarctic marine life my research focus. It was a place that probably like many here that have been I instantly connected to despite its obvious extremeness and it felt entirely like home. Antarctica, as Megan has pointed out, and you'll probably hear this more, is the world's powerhouse. It's our engine room that effectively keeps our world ticking. Most of us are aware that Antarctica drives our climate and our weather systems, and every time we get hit by a vicious southerly, maybe like today, uh, or the other week like we had a smattering of snowflakes falling, uh, we are more than aware of Otatahi's proximity to the white expanse below us. Antarctica, though, is also the engine room of our oceans, and this engine powers ocean currents that then feed out around the rest of the oceans like giant conveyor belts. When the Antarctic Ocean Room is disrupted, the conveyor belts around the rest of the globe are impacted, slowed, and changed. There's growing awareness from the work that Tim Nash and others do uh, are doing that as the ice sheets in Antarctica melt and collapse with climate change, that rising sea levels are impacting us here in New Zealand, our Pacific neighbours, and much further afield. And South Brighton here is in a special danger zone. But what you may not know that 
Antarctica can also be thought of as a living engine room. It's a highly productive zone of life, and although Antarctica was once a forested green haven, teeming with plants, animals, and other biota on land a few million years ago, the origin of the powerful primary productivity today lurks underneath in the seawater. The planktonic blooms that emanate from the sea ice and Antarctic waters can in turn be linked directly or indirectly to ecological systems across the rest of the globe. So climate change is just one substantial environmental pressure, and it's a big one, that impacts the atmosphere and our land masses. Other challenges include erosion, rainfall, drought, pollution, and water quality issues. And all of these, in turn, impact on our biodiversity, our primary industries, and our lives in general. We can think of all these environmental challenges as a complex jigsaw puzzle, where we can't look at just climate change, for example, in isolation, but rather consider it as interlocking and connected to and influenced by these many other factors. And the same is true for our oceans. So climate change is a term with awareness that you, you probably all have, and that might, may be why you're here. Uh, but what's lesser known is the impact of rising carbon dioxide uh, that feeds into the atmosphere also in turn impacts on the oceans and ocean life. So our oceans are very kind to us. They soak up mo most of their excess CO2 that we are producing like a giant sponge but it comes at a cost for the oceans and for marine life. So the soaking up of the excess CO2 protects us from an even greater amount in the atmosphere, but it's changing the chemistry of the oceans and lowering pH. And, and this is resulting in our seas becoming more acidic, which is called ocean acidification, and is commonly known in science circles as climate change's evil twin. This is a very separate process to climate change, but it's also linked to our man-made output of CO2. So these rising temperatures also that affect us on land affect the oceans too, uh, just like, um, and in turn that's affecting the engine room of ocean currents in Antarctica that then impacts on oceanic circulation, making it more erratic around the globe, changing the patterns, much in the same way as we may notice this more erratic weather here as a result of climate change. Just look at the last few days here in Otatahi. So along with decreasing pH and this rising temperature in the sea, and just like that jigsaw puzzle I mentioned on land, there's an equally complex interlocking jigsaw puzzle of challenges facing oceans and marine life. And uh, ocean acidification affects uh, anything from fish to shellfish, from plankton, uh, the impacts are widespread. So other impacts are pollution to de dead zones of low oxygen, to freshwater impacts from melting ice, to sediment issues, to layering of water instead of it mixing. Uh, there are many uh, factors that interplay to affect what lives on the oceans. The challenge, though, I think, with the seas is that unlike on land where we are confronted and exposed to what we have in front of us every day, the murky realm is often just that, forgotten, not immediately thought of, and generally not understood. We don't see it, so we often don't value our marine life. So climate change and ocean acidification, I think, can be viewed just as the tips of what I would describe as an extraordinary, complex, melting iceberg of challenges threatening our globe and, in fact, us. And um, we have this new core Centre of Research Excellence announcement, which is wonderful uh, to see that ocean processes are finally getting the attention they deserve with the coastal people, southern skies, uh, bid, which is giving $32 million of research funding over seven years to coastal communities in the Pacific. The challenge as scientists that we have is not how to come together to adequately work out how this jigsaw puzzle iceberg works and how best to mitigate those negative impacts for healthy outcomes for everyone on Earth and everything. It's also how, as both scientists and science communicators, we communicate this complexity and the uncertainties that inevitably exist, and how to contribute to what we call the science policy nexus, which is how science knowledge feeds into policy, whilst recognising that science is only just one piece of another jigsaw puzzle of how policy is put together. 
So communicating climate change is challenging, not just because it's interlinked with all the other environmental issues I mentioned, but because historically scientists have relied on a model of throwing facts at you with the hope that if they just force feed you a bit like a, a goose being force fed um, corn for foie gras, that you'd suddenly get awareness and want to take action on climate change. Uh, perhaps I think scientists should have looked at parenting techniques and what actually works with children as a, a model for what might work with people in general. So luckily we've come a really long way uh, with our understanding of how to communicate science and we've got great scientists like Tim and his team, his Melting Ice and Rising Seas team that recently won the Prime Minister's Science Prize because they can communicate incredibly well uh, to many audiences their world leading research. So what matters is not shoving information down your throats, uh, but understanding what makes you and I tick. As a science communicator, I need to understand your values, and your values, and your values. What matters to you, and if we want us all to come together and make change that will slow down and halt climate change and eventually ocean acidification, although we, we are looking at centuries of impact already, then it's understanding and making use of what's called shared helpful values. What common values do you have that, and I have and we all have that we can connect on and talk about? What drives us forward together? Am I the best person to be talking to you right now or is it someone from your own community? I'm only one part of the puzzle. All disciplines, all areas, the arts, the humanities, industry all have a role to play and we can all learn something from them. So yesterday I ran an event with a world premiere of a virtual reality experience of Antarctica that we at the Royal Society of Te Aparangi have funded in collaboration with Antarctic filmmaker Anthony Powell and the Hit Lab at, at Canterbury Uni. As I immerse myself back in Antarctica after 10 long absent years, I once again felt utterly at home. And yet I also got to experience something new. For the first time I experienced in virtual reality what it's like to be under the sea ice, surrounded by wedding, singing weed owl seals, looking above me at the primary productivity of the sea ice and that green glow. And in bringing this virtual reality experience to the world, I hope that we can give many more people awareness of the importance of Antarctica and fitting into that jigsaw puzzle and that complex melting iceberg and the role Antarctica plays. And in allowing people to experience underwater um, virtually, I think this is just one way of people connecting to and better understanding what lies beneath, what lies beyond. Thank you. Thanks, Vic. I did the math. It was 35 years ago we started going to school together. <coughs> She's not even listening. Um, next up, we have Professor Tim Nash. Again, probably the last time I call you Professor tonight, Tim. Um, uh, Tim is, oh, I've got my, in my notes, though. Tim is a professor in Earth Sciences at the Antarctic Research Centre at Victoria University in Wellington. Uh, he, where he was a director from 2008 to 2017, uh, before taking up a Royal Society of New Zealand James Cook Fellowship. His research focuses on past, present and future climate change, with specific emphasis on how the Antarctic ice sheets respond to climate change and influence global sea level. Tim has leadership positions in World Climate Research Programme and Scientific Committee on Antarctic Research, as well as the Antarctic Science Platform. And there's a strong commitment to communication of Antarctic and climate change science and its relevance to policy and society, much like Vic. He sits on the Australian Government's National Advisory Committee on Climate Science and he was lead author on the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC fifth assessment report. He has received the New Zealand Antarctic Medal, Martha Muse Prize for Antarctic Science and Policy, New Zealand Prime Minister's Science Prize and he's a fellow of the Royal Society of New Zealand. And here he is, Tim Nash. Nā mihi nui ki a koutou katoa. Um, we've got to stop doing these bios. They're just, well, no, they're, someone wants to know how flash you are. Oh, it's just, it's a little bit too much. And, and then it chews into my time, because I like to speak a little bit as well. But thank you, Megan, for that, that lovely introduction. Um, yeah, so I'm... I'm an earth scientist, I'm a climate scientist, I'm very interested in Antarctica and I'm really concerned 
about what's happening to Antarctica as a consequence of climate change and then what that means um, for us, for, for hu humanity. Um, so I've been looking at the science for quite a while now and um, I'm becoming increasingly concerned and worried. So I've, I've got more and more into the communication space um, and really trying to communicate what we know as scientists so we can so we can get action going. But I worry, and I'll probably do this tonight, and Vic alluded to it, that I'll give you too many facts. Um, I'll depress you, I'll get you concerned, and I'm not sure it's necessarily the best approach, this whole knowledge deficit approach, which us scientists love to get up here and, and tell you, whoa, it's really bad, and you really want to know, is there hope, and, and what can I do about it? And so we'll, hopefully I'll give you some of the bad news so you know that there is a problem but I think there is still a little bit of hope. We might touch on that a bit more um, in this panel discussion. Yeah, and I think, you know, doing things this way with people from really different backgrounds, sharing their stories and their own views is a lot more powerful as well. And I've been working with artists a lot, and it's a cool way to sort of communicate um, some of the things we are worried about and some of the things we have to take really seriously with, with, with the world we're living in. So let's go back to my um, passion and I'll talk a bit about climate change um, and what it means for us and we'll see where we end up. Um, so Antarctica of course is this amazing place that y we're just totally privileged as scientists to go there. Um, it's got this, all these superlatives, it's the highest, the driest, the coldest, the windiest, the most remote and the most pristine um, continent. Um, it has a huge ice sheet. And if that ice sheet melted, sea level would rise by 60 metres. It's not going to do that overnight. It's going to take hundreds to thousands of years to melt. Um, but it has started melting. And if we continue to put the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere at the rate we're doing and heating the planet, we will potentially set up a scenario when we, can, we could melt that ice sheet. We could melt um, the world to much higher sea levels, tens of tens of metres higher. Um, one of the, and Vic also alluded to this, one of the, the, the um, strangest facts that always gets me every time I say it is we've had a degree of global warming so far from the greenhouse gases we've put in the atmosphere. But we should have had 35 degrees. We should have a, a Venus-like atmosphere if it wasn't for the ocean. So as Vic said, the ocean is in a way our friend. It's taking up 90% of the heat from global warming. It's taking up a lot of the CO2. But of course, that then causes other problems like ocean acidification. And the heat that's going into the ocean is largely being concentrated around the Southern Ocean, around Antarctica. And so Antarctica is actually melting from the bottom up, not from the top down, because of the ocean heat. It's quite insidious. We actually can't see the warming. We know it's happening because we can measure the ice sheet with satellites. So we know it's getting smaller, it's shrinking, and it's losing mass at an accelerating rate. A lot of people look at the Arctic and go, oh my goodness, this is where all the action is with climate change, and it is. It's much more visible up there, but there's a big sleeping giant, and that's the Antarctic ice sheet. And um, that's something we're very concerned as scientists, how it will respond. Um, and whether we have time with, with our um, climate mitigation challenge to prevent some of the, the more serious impacts from, from affecting us. Okay. Um, science tells us that Antarctica is not quite as easy as Greenland to understand. So a Greenland ice sheet is melting as well. But we can model that better. And the problem is the ocean, the way the, effect, the ocean affects Antarctica um, and the potential for something really rapid to happen, something, a tipping point to be crossed, a non-linear response where we don't just get a little bit of sea level rise, we get really rapid sea level rise from the melting. And it looks like that tipping point is around two, deg two degrees of global warming. So we're, we're, we're almost there, we're halfway there, got another degree to go happens to be the Paris target, right? So that's the climate target that all nations, the world, has agreed 
We, every country signed this, 196 countries have signed this and said we will get global warming below two degrees. And our governments of course put that into legislation um, with the Carbon, Carbon Zero Act. Um, and so it turns out that if we can achieve that target, one of the impacts we can avoid is ongoing and rapid sea level rise. We can potentially save the Antarctic ice sheet. Um, so that's really something worth shooting for. I mean, I think that's a, a small message of hope amongst all this doom and gloom. Um, okay. What else did I want to say? <laughs> okay, a couple of points. I want to talk briefly about sea level rise and I want to talk briefly about COVID um, and climate change. Um, in terms of sea level rise, we do have these two futures, right? So if we hit the Paris target, we can minimise the amount of sea level rise and save the Antarctic ice sheet. Um, so at the moment, we're looking about 1 metre, 1.2 metres of sea level rise around the world by the end of the century. If we carry on the way we're going, that could be as much as two metres if Antarctica does something a bit tricky and unpredictable. And that's really tough for decision makers because we can't give them a precise number. But we have the control on this. And the reason that um, we have all this uncertainty is because we don't know how we're going to do at mitigating greenhouse gases. So, you know, if we really get on top of this problem, then the uncertainty sort of goes away. Some of the uncertainty is still related to the science. And the, and the dynamics. But what we can put in the bank is 30 centimetres of sea level rise. We can't avoid that. That's coming down, down the pipeline and that'll be here by 2060. We've got that um, because of the heat that's, that's already, already in the system. And even if we achieve the Paris target, we're still going to get 50 centimetres of sea level rise globally. And by 2050 what that means, and we can't avoid this, 18 million people in Bangladesh will be affected by high tide flooding. Um, by the end of the century, 800 million people around the world will be affected by high tide flooding. And that, and that really can't be avoided. Um, so we think of human migration, we think of Syria, we think of what 2 million people did to Europe um, and caused the destabilisation, the rise of the far right, Brexit, Trump, you know, arguably, and that all came from climate change. So this is 18 million people by 2050. So that's the scary stuff. Um, the hope stuff. Um, there's still time. And I think COVID is a really interesting thing because it's shown us that we can face an existential threat, a global crisis, and, and, and very quickly and globally if we choose to, if we, we want to. Um, you know, we've got some bad actors in the world, we know that, um, that we've got to work with them. We've also got this one-off opportunity. So I don't know if you know the number, it's incredible, and I've, I've written it down, but I think it's, Rod will know, I think it's $10 trillion. Uh, so $10 trillion is being invested globally in, by governments in the rebuild of economies. And so we've got this, this one-off opportunity to do it right, to do it in a way that's sustainable and provides a future um, whereby we not only make the world a better place socially and economically, but we make the world um, carbon zero and we attack the climate problem at the same time. That sort of money is not going to come around in <laughs> probably another generation. So, you know, we've got this dual opportunity right now um, to, really, to really address this, this big problem. Um, and I think that's a reason for hope. Um, 7% reductions in greenhouse gases as a consequence of COVID for this year. Now, if we did that, if we were locked down for 20 years, no one wants that, we'd, we'd get to carbon zero. Um, I'm sure there's a more sustainable way of doing that, but that's how quickly you can bring the CO2 out of the atmosphere, and I'll, I'll stop right there. Yeah, 20 years of lockdown, I don't think anyone wants that, especially me with my kids stuck at home. Um, our next speaker is Rod Oram, a journalist and an author. I was a journalist in my previous life, and Rod's name um, was legendary. Um, I'm sure it's legendary with many of you who have read his, um, his um, articles and columns. Rod is, of course, a business journalist, um, contributes weekly to Newsroom, 9 to Noon, News Talk ZB. 
He's a public speaker on a deep sustainability, business, economics and innovation. He's a member of the Edmund Hillary Fellowship, which brings people uh, together uh, from here and abroad who seek to contribute to global change from Aotearoa. In 2019, Rod was a winner of the general business category in the Australia and New Zealand region Global Journalism Awards, and that was for his columns in Newsroom on Fonterra, and he was also New Zealand Journalist of the Year. Um, he's a founding trustee and the second chairman of Akina Foundation, which um, helps social enterprises develop their business models in areas of sustainability. He's also, in 2016, was his most recent book, which is Three Cities, Seeking Hope in the Anthropocene. Um, tonight, Rod is going to talk to us about how do we make people care enough to fight hard enough to take action on climate change. Um, kia ora tato, and um, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, so first of all, um, thank you, Lawrence, for having us here in the Carbo Cathedral. I, I can't think of a better place to consider um, great disruptions like the climate crisis in a place that um, is the living symbol of uh, great creative responses to such disruptions. Um, so I'm always um, very fond of the, uh, this place and uh, glad to be here. But thank you also uh, for the invitation to be on the panel. Um, and the third thank you is to um, Antarctic New Zealand because I had the huge privilege of um, having a week down on the ice in December 2014. Um, and I, I want to start with that um, because it had um, a huge impact on me. Um, it was about the enormity of the place, uh, the deep, deep natural silence. Um, and then uh, things I hadn't expected, like the incredibly brightly colored uh, marine life, which I only saw um, in, um, in tanks at the um, at Murdo station. Uh, not actually um, out in the water itself. But I wasn't prepared for that. Um, and uh, wasn't prepared for that great sort of fecundity of the Antarctic Ocean that um, Victoria um, was talking about, and, um, and Tim too. The, um, but so many other powerful things too. Um, obviously Erebus, um, slightly smoking and looming large on the horizon from Scott Base, and all um, our New Zealand um, story of that uh, with the Erebus disaster, for example. Um, but then over at McMurdo, um, the Chapel of the Snows and how that came to be built, um, but particularly how the chalice goes back uh, to the chapel um, every summer, it summers in Antarctica, and all the wonderful history, even though the origins of the chalice are a little murky, I gather, <laughs> quite how old it is, it's a subject of some, um, uh, descript, uh, some dispute. Um, but so much other wonderful history um, about Antarctica and New Zealand's uh, connection with it, uh, whether it be the creation of Scott Base um, to, uh, as our contribution to the Commonwealth Trans-Antarctic Expedition and the way Ed turned up with Massey Ferguson tractors um, and um, all the wonderful um, um, uh, stories that flow from that. Um, and then all the other connections here. So um, an incredible visit to Scott's um, Terra Nova hut at Cape Evans, um, obviously where his last expedition was based. Um, hut made in London, but trial erected out in Littleton Harbor and named after the, the expedition ship before it was taken down to the ice. And then the restoration of those historic huts uh, led wonderfully by Rob Fennick, uh, who's one of my, uh, was a, great friend and one of my great heroes, uh, who sadly died far too young, uh, just in March of this year. But above all, it was about sitting on Observation Hill, um, and as um, uh, Scott's colleagues had sat for a very long time, uh, constantly scanning, hoping for his eventual return, which of course never happened, and looking out from Observation Hill at White Island and Black Island. And for me, it became... Um, kind of a, a bit of a metaphor uh, um, of um, that sense of dread but some anticipation about the future uh, that um, I certainly feel about the climate crisis and the waiting and the waiting for something to happen. So, so many stories um, about Antarctica and one of the things that surprised me hugely on my return was that people were very uh, loved to hear that I'd been, and, but very quickly the conversation um, 
sort of petered out after the obvious comments about Antarctica. And yet there are so many incredible stories about Antarctica and New Zealand's connection there. And, and of course, all the really important um, um, Earth system science um, that Victoria and Tim talk about. And that, I, I think we really need to um, bring home to New Zealand um, to help us understand um, our role, uh, both as humans in the climate crisis and what we have to do about it. But importantly also, um, New Zealand's distinctive role in how we might respond. So um, on the distinctive role, Antarctica, of course, is a unique commons, uh, uh, both because of its climate and life, but also because it's the one piece of the planet that we humans so far have done the least damage to, um, partly by not populating it, um, except for um, scientists being down there. Um, and, and yet, that concept of the commons is one that um, Antarctica has really got to grips with. So um, the Antarctic Treaty and its related agreements in the treaty system um, um, got underway with the signature in December 1st, 1959, and New Zealand was one of the original signatories to the Antarctic Treaty. And um, both through that and um, uh, uh, um, complementary work on um, uh, around ecosystem stuff in Antarctica, we've played a really important role. And of course, um, the treaty system is heading for um, some very, very big changes in decades to come, where that um, um, so far reasonably successful attempt at governance over a huge commons uh, will be hugely challenged. So I think New Zealand has an incredibly important role to play in that, just as we do in other international organizations like the Paris uh, climate negotiations, where it was our idea uh, for independent, nationally determined contributions, which um, broke the logjam um, that had um, bedeviled those uh, negotiations for many, many years. And that then um, was the breakthrough that made the Paris Climate Agreement possible. So, um, but things are changing incredibly fast in Antarctica, as we're hearing from the scientists. Um, but they're moving incredibly slowly in terms of the human response to that. And that's why I think Antarctica is such an important story um, and the great history um, to be able to tell about that. I, I'd like to um, end with a, one further point, um, which to me is at the heart of all this that I don't think we will do enough until we care enough, and I don't think we'll care enough until we um, actually uh, find or reestablish our spiritual relationship with the rest of creation. Now, I say that as an Anglican, um, but whatever one's faith, or even if it's not um, a, a formal faith that leads you to some relationship with the rest of um, uh, of these uh, in, incredible life on this planet that we, we won't be making progress on that. So I think to be able to draw through um, something of the spiritual connection, and I know Em's going to be talking far, far more powerfully about that than I can, um, is fundamentally important. So I want to just um, finish with a couple of quotes that um, 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 in some way speak to this. So the first one is from Charles Eisenstein, an American, and from his book, Fear of a Living Planet. Um, I don't know about you, but I didn't become an environmentalist because someone made a rational argument that convinced me that the planet was in danger. I became an environmentalist out of love and pain, love for the world and its beauty, and the grief of seeing it destroyed. It was only because I was in touch with those feelings that I had the ears to listen to the evidence and reason and eyes to see what is happening to our world. I believe that this love and this grief are latent in every human being. When they awaken, these, uh, that person becomes an environmentalist. And then the other quote is far, in some ways far more challenging. This is from Roy Scranton's book, um, Learning to Die in the Anthropocene. And when I first read the book, and now a few years back, I found this very challenging because it talks about the end of civilization, uh, and we've arrived at that point. But if we think in civilization as our operating system, what we do, our technology, our values, um, then I think we do understand um, how radical the changes we need to make. 
So here's Scranton. The greatest challenge we face is a philosophical one, understanding that this civilization is already dead. The sooner we confront our situation and realize there is nothing that we can do to save ourselves, the sooner we can get down to the difficult task of adapting with mortal humility to the new reality. It is very challenging, but think of it this way. No other generation in human history has ever had to create a new civilization in less than a generation, but that's what we're doing. So we shouldn't be hung up on um, and, uh, confronting that, and, um, but in rather we should see it as a, a fantastic opportunity um, to um, end up in a better place that um, goes even further than investing better in the COVID recovery. Thank you. Thank you, Rod. Um, Associate Professor Krusha Watine is from Massey University and studies Indigenous philosophy. Um, she's part of the philosophy program at the university and her research focuses on moral and political philosophies of well-being, development and justice with a particular commitment to indigenous philosophies. She works closely with her own hapu and iwi in the far north to support the revitalisation and sustaining of Māori philosophy. And she's part of the Vision Mātauranga team of Ross Sea Region Research and Monitoring Plan, which um, has the gorgeous um, acronym of Ross Ramp, um, with Dr Priscilla Wehi. Tonight, Krusha will provide some thoughts on the value of Indigenous philosophies for reimagining our relationships and responsibilities to Antarctica and the natural world. Krusha. Tēnā tātou i raro i te ahuatanga o te pō. Ngā mihi ki te haukainga nei, nō reira, tēnā koutou. Ko Krusha Wātene tēnei e mihi atu nei, he uri nō Ngāpuhi Ngāti Whātua me Tonga. Tēnā rā tātou katoa. So we've heard a lot already about the beauty of Antarctica, its vastness, its emptiness, its pristine environment. But I also think there's um, a rich knowledge in Antarctica that we can also dig into. Um, and the research that I'm involved in concerns, at least in, in part, the opportunity that Antarctica presents us with to rethink our relationships with each other and with the natural world. And I think indigenous philosophies have an important role to play here. Indigenous philosophies draw attention to, and then they record the places where our lives with each other and the natural environment meet. They provide an account of the varied connections and relationships between people and all things, making sense of the world through relationships. Within this framework, the whakapapa framework, this complex network, this jigsaw puzzle, relationships with land and seascapes, are similarly complex and multi-layered. Our physical connections, and I think Antarctica helps to show how this is the case, um, are only one of the ways that we can be connected to a place. Voyaging, such as Ngai Tahu Kōrero, about early voyages embedded in naming and, and stories, um, exploration, migratory patterns, um, such as the migratory patterns of whales linking the Pacific, with the sub-Antarctic waters, um, our shared histories and narratives, uh, a sense of community and common purpose, scientific research, um, spirituality, are all part of the many ways our lives are woven through and storied with and into each other and the natural world. What's more, these connections can ground responsibilities in indigenous philosophies, when we map the relationships within which we stand, we're also mapping a system of responsibilities to each other in the natural world. In Māori philosophy in particular, when we talk about responsibilities and the responsibilities that fall out of this complex network of relationships, what we tend to be referring to today are concepts, familiar concepts for people in Aotearoa New Zealand like manaakitanga and kaitiakitanga. What's important about these concepts 
is the idea that we enhance our own lives by enhancing the lives of other entities, other human beings, other communities, non-human animals, and the natural world generally. On this kind of view, responsibilities to others are at the same time responsibilities to ourselves, simply because our lives make sense, at least in part, in relation to the lives of others. By enhancing or diminishing the well-being of others, landscapes, seascapes, different non-human animals, I can enhance or diminish my own, my own mana. Māori philosophy here acknowledges the interdependence of all things for well-being and for flourishing. And the reciprocal relationships which exist between people and between people in the natural world. Kaitiakitanga, by framing these responsibilities in terms of trusteeship or guardianship, shape and centre collective responsibilities to protect and to enhance these relationships. This reciprocal relationship means that the natural world, non-human species, land and seascapes, other entities, story us as well. Māori philosophies themselves have travelled across geographical spaces and are woven through multiple generations of lived experiences within diverse social, political, cultural, economic and natural environments. So when we're thinking about Māori philosophy, what we're thinking about is a body of knowledge that our Polynesian ancestors brought with them to Aotearoa, New Zealand. We're thinking about the knowledge gathered during early life here, as well as the ongoing experiences of living here together. Our ideas often can't just be planted, and they haven't been planted, into new ground. We know that they must be grown, sometimes in new ways, in ways appropriate for different places, and for the opportunities and challenges that arise. And so Antarctica raises interesting questions about the place of Māori concepts, such as kaitiakitanga, for grounding the way we think about our relationships and responsibilities. There's a question that Antarctica throws back at us. What would it look like in Antarctica to be kaitiaki? What would it look like for that concept to make sense there? And how could this idea, how could this idea of kaitiakitanga reshape our global responsibilities? There is uh, much to learn from Antarctica, not least about what we have reason to value and the role of indigenous philosophy, and Māori philosophy in particular, for answering this question. Antarctica prompts deep, critical reflection about what world we should leave behind for future generations, the transformative change that we as a global community need to undertake and the role that Aotearoa New Zealand and all of us here can play in charting that change. Kia ora, mai tato. Kia ora, uh, Professor John Cottles, the Chief Science Advisor, sorry, Scientific Advisor at Antarctica New Zealand. I should know that because he's a colleague of mine. Um, he doesn't normally wear a tie, but tonight he has. <laughs> and that's because his son has just started a school where they have to wear ties, and he wouldn't wear a tie unless his dad wore one. Um, however, I like to think it's also for us. Um, John is a professor of geology at the, was a professor of geology at the University of California in Santa Barbara, and that's before he um, came to us, so he was there for 12 years. He's done 10 field seasons on the ice, working with New Zealand, United States, and Italian um, Antarctic programs as both a guide and a scientist. So he's the kind of guy that if you're lost in Antarctica, you want to make sure he's there to look after you. He'll tell you about it, and then he'll keep you safe. He has research interests, um, his research interests centre on the geologic evolution of Antarctica and the Himalaya. He's published more than 120 scientific papers, and he began his career at University of Otago, didn't we all, John, uh, where he has an MSc in Antarctic Geology and a PhD at the University of Oxford, which of course wasn't in Otago. Um, his postdoctoral position at the British Geological Survey. Uh, 
John leads the Antarctic New Zealand science team and supports the delivery of world-class research and the communication of research findings. Tonight John's going to talk to us um, about the New Zealand Antarctic Research Programme, supporting world-leading science to understand life in a rapidly changing world. Thank you, Megan. Yeah, it was either a, a fight with my son for 30 minutes to get him to wear a tie, or to a tie and tie knot uh, for five seconds and then everyone to be happy. So I guess, you know, the one thing I think tonight is it's about compromise. So uh, hopefully that's working in our household. Uh, so I want to take you back 20 years, actually, uh, next week, uh, 20 years ago. Uh, I first uh, stepped on a plane to Antarctica as a 20-year-old, a very young graduate student, not old anymore, but a 20-year-old graduate student. And I stepped off the plane and I thought, this is a place I'd never ever want to leave. This is a fantastic place that has everything I ever would dream of. It has mountains, it has snow, it has rocks to look at. What more could you want? <clears throat> and fast forward three months after spending three months living in a tent, eating freeze-dried food, uh, not really sleeping very well because of 24 hour daylight and constantly thinking about science. And I remember getting on that plane thinking, you know what, I'd be okay if I never came back to this place ever again. <laughs> and then, you get back to Christchurch and you find the nearest place that will serve you fresh food and you eat the salad and, and you sit back and you think, I'm looking at the green grass outside and how can I get back to Antarctica? And how can I go back? What can I do? And so for my uh, scientific uh, uh, um, career, I've really been kind of in that different states of mind. I go there and I think, I never want to go back here. And again, I get back and I think, this is a fantastic place to understand how the earth works and how should we uh, continue to, to understand how Antarctica works. And the reason I, I mention this really is, is New Zealand is extremely lucky because we have a, a very large group of scientists who have that commitment to go to Antarctica year after year to sacrifice a lot to actually understand how Antarctica works. And so uh, as New Zealanders, you should be proud of, of the New Zealand Antarctic Program because we do a lot for, for our size. And so tonight I want to share with you a little bit more about <coughs> the New Zealand Antarctic Research Program and just give you some examples of the kinds of things we're working on and really how that might uh, help contribute to some of the things we've heard about uh, already tonight. And so you've already heard that Antarctica is a significant landmass. If you take Antarctica, it's about 10% of Earth's surface, but it holds something like 90% of the fresh water uh, on Earth. And so anything that happens in Antarctica is going to affect uh, both Antarctica, but also uh, the rest of the planet. And because of its size and its, its physical position and also the, the things that go on in Antarctica in terms of, of climate and changes in, in atmosphere and oceans, it really has a huge uh, influence on, on uh, the Earth system. And so more than that though, the research that, we've, that people in New Zealand and, and elsewhere have done over the last 60 or so years has really revealed that the continent itself is changing and it, it's changing a lot and really at an unprecedented rate uh, of change. And, and so I think really what I'd like to convince you of, it's really, and I hopefully you've heard it really this evening, is it's really imperative to continue that research, to understand what those changes are likely to be in terms of their magnitude, but also uh, when and, and how those changes will, will play out. And, and in other words, really, I think there's a lot that we really don't know about Antarctica, and we're not going to find out unless we continue to do research down there. And so... <clears throat> With that kind of overarching goal of understanding change in Antarctica, the New Zealand Antarctic Research Program has supported science for at least the last 60 years. And we've done everything from, from geology to biology, ocean, atmospheric science, and pretty much everything in between. And, and New Zealand scientists have, have made a raft of really very important discoveries and, and uh, made important contributions to understanding how Antarctica works. And it's, we have a very great historical perspective on that science, but if you go to uh, any uh, recent Antarctic field season and you look at the scientists that were down there, there are a lot of scientists today who are making great uh, strides in understanding how Antarctica uh, operates. And so those questions that those scientists are really trying to answer are probably amongst the most important questions uh, of our time. Thinking about things like ice sheet stability, which, which Tim has, has been uh, really uh, heavily involved in, sea ice formation, how resilient those ecosystems are to, to change, and really uh, things like how effective uh, some of our marine protected areas actually are. And so their research actually informs uh, policies as well as how we might plan, prepare for, and predict uh, future climate change. So tonight I really want to just quickly share with you three examples of research that's uh, I think somewhat reflective of the breadth and depth of, of New Zealand's contribution to Antarctic science. 
And so really, I think Tim really should be the one to, to speak about the, the first example. And, and that is really you take an extremely large drill and you drill through uh, an ice shelf and you look at the sediments beneath that ice shelf and that actually can tell you a lot about how these ice sheets have behaved in the past. And frankly, New Zealand scientists are teaching the world about how to do this. Right? New Zealand has a relatively small research program, but, but that actually uh, drove a lot of the innovative work that Tim and colleagues have done on really trying to understand how those ice sheets are behaving now and also how they've behaved uh, in the past. And so what we'd like to know, for example, is how does that ice sheet behave through time? Has it collapsed in the past? How long did that take and when might that have happened? And what was the result both, for example, in Antarctica but also uh, globally? So understanding those kinds of fundamental uh, issues really is going to help with our future predictions of, of what might happen when sea level rises. And so we have a bunch of earth scientists who are drilling holes in ice sheets and understanding uh, the sediments beneath them. And kind of re somewhat related to that, we have a, a lot of New Zealand researchers who are focused on understanding sea ice. And, and sea ice really is, is basically frozen ocean. But what's interesting about sea ice is it's really one of the largest physical changes that our planet undergoes. Right? We think about formation of sea ice, we change the salinity of, of the, the oceans, how much salt uh, remaining in that water that's uh, left behind from that process. But also when that sea ice melts, it, it creates uh, ocean currents that uh, affect the global ocean circulation pattern. And so we'd like to understand when and how that sea ice forms and how that might change uh, in a warming planet. And so to understand sea ice in a way is to really understand the global ocean uh, circulation and pattern. And so both of those two uh, key areas of research are really focused on the, the, physical, uh, the physical world. But we also have researchers who are really interested in what the ecosystem in Antarctica is doing and how resilient it might be to change. And in particular, we would uh, imagine looking at things like uh, understanding how the sea ice uh, is changing and how that might affect the Antarctic food web all the way up to uh, the top predators. And so understanding how the Antarctic food chain is changing, everything from those really small soil microbes to uh, understanding uh, uh, orca, uh, killer whales, penguins, seals, things like that. And so there is a large research program uh, that's being undertaken right now to really understand <coughs> excuse me, what's happening uh, in this Ross Sea Marine Protected Area. So the Ross Sea Marine Protected Area, the Ross Ramp that we refer to, is the world's largest uh, marine protected area and it's sitting immediately south of us. And so one thing we'd really like to know is how effective is that marine protected area going to be? And so to understand how effective it is, we need to understand what's going on in that area in terms of uh, the top predators, but also the lower parts of, of the food chain. And, and so I just want to finish by saying, you know, New Zealand is a, a very small country, but our research impact is extremely large. It's really disproportionate to the size of, of our program. And I think that fundamentally reflects the passion that our scientists have for their topics but also the closeness and I think the sense of, uh, of duty and also the sense of place that people uh, and scientists in New Zealand really have. And that extends to things like the Antarctic Treaty. So for example, if, we, if you were to go to an Antarctic Treaty meeting, you would see New Zealand playing an extremely important role in that. And in fact, many countries with much larger research programs than us look to New Zealand for guidance on how to navigate the treaty system. And and, and likewise, Antarctic science is also a real uh, pillar, although somewhat underestimated pillar, of our foreign uh, policy. A lot of the negotiations we do with different countries uh, really revolve around our Antarctic science program. What can New Zealand teach other Antarctic programs and, and how can we help those Antarctic programs uh, continue to, to flourish? And so I want to finish by saying you know, I think there's a lot more to learn uh, about Antarctica, but I think as a nation we should be really proud of what we've achieved so far. There's a lot more to learn. But I think we have done a lot of great research and there's a lot of great research going on now. And I think it really will help inform a bunch of the issues that, that the previous speakers have, have spoken about. So I think as New Zealanders, we have a lot to be proud of uh, for our Antarctic research program. So thank you very much. Thank you, John. Um, I feel like I want to, um, I know that I'm not supposed to educate everyone because it's about um, um, emotion and, 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 um, and love of the planet, but I want to explain what the different ices are that everyone's talking about. Is that okay if I do that? Awesome. Have we, have we got any scientists in the room? Good. Forgive me. Um, so we all know now that Antarctica has land underneath. The ice that sits on top of that is called ice sheet. So when you hear them talking about ice sheet, that's the ice that sits on the land. That's up to about 4.7 kilometres thick in places in Antarctica. On average it's about 2 kilometres thick, so it's a heap of ice. 
Um, as that ice flows off the land, which it does, like glaciers and, and through things like that, it starts to float, and as it floats, it becomes ice shelf. So when we talk about the ice shelf, that's the, the land that has flowed off, sorry, the ice that's flowed off the land and is floating on the ice. So we drill through that and get to the water underneath and then look at the, um, the sea floor underneath that. And then the sea ice is the ice that forms and melts each year, um, or most years, or some years. And so that's what um, is a literally frozen ocean. So there you go, that's a, you can take that home and bank it. Um, thank you, do you like that? Not a scientist. Yeah, yeah, I probably could. I quite like that. Dr. Nicol. Yeah. Go with it. Professor, that sounds better. Yeah. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Emily Colgan, um, and she is at the Trinity Methodist Theological College, where she's a biblical scholar. So she's a senior lecturer in biblical studies, and re her research focuses on the relationship between the Bible and contemporary social imaginaries. Um, asking about the degree to which the ideologies contained within biblical texts continue to inform communities in the present. And she's particularly interested in ecological representations in the Bible, as well as depictions of gender and violence. Tonight, Emily's going to talk to us about how Christian communities can contribute meaningfully to the conversation on climate change. I'm really looking forward to this one. So here she is, Emily Colgan. Thank you. Um, and kia ora mai tato e mihi nui ana kia koutou katoa. Um, I need to be up front. <laughs> um, I am in theological education. Um, so Antarctica and matters of science are way, way above my pay grade. Um, so I'm going to speak to you tonight um, about theology and ecology. Um, and I think this kind of links with the question, one of the questions that Rod raised around how do people come to care about climate change the climate crisis, and our role and responsibility in it. So, despite climate change being acknowledged as among the most critical issues faced by the Earth community, this unprecedented threat to the planet has failed to galvanize humanity, and questions remain as to whether the political will e exists to address the situation quickly and effectively. One of the things that I'm really interested in is exploring how Christian communities might re-examine their faith traditions and recover ecologically apposite insights which then might then inspire these communities towards the urgently needed positive responses to the climate crisis. Now, there are many ways in which we can examine climate change from a theological perspective, but I want to talk tonight about the idea of origin stories. Broadly speaking, an origin story is a narrative which reveals how a particular place or person or group of people came into being. It explains the nature of a particular reality. Sometimes these stories are understood literally. Sometimes, probably more often, they're read, thought about metaphorically. Probably the most well-known and influential biblical origin story is the story of the origin of the world in Genesis 1. The account details God's creation of the world in seven days, with the climactic appearance of human beings on day six. In recent years, however, a number of ecological theologians have begun to argue that Genesis 1 is problematic as the dominant Christian origin story, and it leads to problems with our theological anthropologies, that is, our theological narratives about who we are as human beings. So in Genesis 1, humans appear as the climax and pinnacle of creation. In verses 26 to 28 we read, God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. Not only does this ecological separation establish humankind as master over the environment, it is argued. It also depicts as God's will the exploitation of earth to serve humanity. In this origin story, humans aren't part of the earth. They're made in the image of God, and they're given the mandate to dominate, to fill, and to subdue the earth. These are words that denote violence. From an ecological perspective, 
the relationship between humanity and Earth is characterised by violence and disconnection in this origin narrative. So, are there other traditions that might help contribute to an, or to an alternative origin narrative for Christian communities, which tries to make sense of our place and purpose in the world in a different way? And if we get a Bible and turn the page, we find Genesis 2, the second creation narrative. Often these two stories are conflated into one, but if you read them carefully, they're clearly two distinct narratives. Typically, we see the main characters in this origin narrative as God, the man, the woman, and sometimes the snake, who comes a little bit later on. But what about the Adama, the Hebrew word for earth? In verse 5 of the story, we learn there is no vegetation on earth because there's no one to serve and nurture Adama. So God takes some soil from Adama and molds it into a figure called Adam, a human being. You'll note there's a strong linguistic connection between the Adama, the earth, and the Adam, the human being. God gives the human the task of completing what is missing at the beginning of the story. The human has the task of greening Adama. A little bit later in verse 15, we read that God took the Adam and put him in the Garden of Eden to serve and preserve it. The Hebrew word abad is often translated in English Bibles as to till, but the word literally means to serve. The first and most fundamental human work here is to serve and preserve Adama, the earth. In this origin narrative, humans were created from earth for earth. Later still, in verse 19, God helps, sorry, Earth helps God to create the animals and birds, and there's a kinship between these creatures and the human being. They both originate from Earth's fertile soil. Earth is their common ancestor and God their creator. In Genesis 2, then, humanity is part of a single unfolding reality. In this origin narrative, Humanity is deeply connected to, and indeed utterly dependent upon, both God and the earth. Over the past little while, I've been working with the Anglican Indigenous Network, and one of the things we've focused on in the context of Aotearoa is the concept of kaitiakitanga, which we've heard about um, already, um, and the strong resonances between kaitiakitanga and concepts of relationality or relationship within the biblical tradition. We note, for example, we've noted, for example, the concept of whanaungatanga, or interconnectedness, connects strongly with the depiction of human beings in Genesis 2. Human existence is intricately and inseparably, sorry, intricately and in inescapably inseparable from Earth and from Earth's other than human community. We also see connections between the biblical instruction to serve and preserve the Earth and the reciprocal patterns of mutual custodianship within kaitiakitanga. As kaitiaki seek to respect the mana of all things in a way that upholds their Māori with tapu, aroha and manaki, so two parts of the biblical tradition seek to recognize and respect the intrinsic worth of other than human life. In the biblical tradition, we're encouraged to see creation as God does and to affirm its goodness. And as we see with the concepts of mana and modi, to recognize the inherent worth of all that exists results in an attitude of restraint and respect. This attitude of restraint, or rahui, calls to mind the set-apart time in the Bible that is Sabbath. This sacred season enables healing and restoration for creation, breaking patterns of unfettered progress and unquestioning consumption of Earth's resources. It is a reminder of the imperative for justice, so that all creation might flourish and have abundant life. I want to return to the eco rereading of the origin narrative in Genesis 2, which resonates with indigenous knowledge that well predates the, the presence of Western Christianity in Aotearoa. 
For Christians in Aotearoa, there is a real potential here for a truly contextual, contemporary theological anthropology, stories about who we are in this place, which respond meaningfully to the climate concerns of our time. These origin stories don't claim to offer solutions to the intricate and complex issues specific to the climate crisis. Rather, they provide faith communities with a foundation for reconceiving their relationship, the relationship between God, earth, and humanity, from which these communities might then address the multiplicity of issues related to the climate crisis in Aotearoa, in Antarctica, and beyond. Kia ora. Sorry, that concludes our presentations for this evening, um, but we can now have a bit of a, a um, panel discussion, and I might just ask, um, Tim, you look big and strong, can you please move this out of the way for me? Thank you. Um, well, no, not that, that one, the heavy one. Oh, honestly, take the stand. Um, and we will, um, I'll, ask, I'll ask some questions and see what comes out of it, but um, I would also like to, has anyone got any questions that they want to ask? Yeah, we do have, okay, we've got a couple, that's good, okay, that's good. I will keep, make sure that I keep some, some time at the end. Oh yeah, that would be wonderful, thank you. Um, we'll just get another microphone. So, um, the aim of tonight obviously is to get everyone's um, varying views, and I want to start off, we've, we've learned a lot tonight about um, that, um, you know, it's not too late, Tim told us it's not too late, there, there was sort of quite a lot of depression in, um, in what he was saying as I was sitting there, but then at the end he said there is still hope, we need to do something, so I guess I'd like to ask and say what can we do as individuals, what can we do to make a difference, because it kind of seems like a bit of a big problem. Don't mind, oh, don't mind starting. Um, it, re it really is difficult, isn't it? Um, and I, I wrestle with this. I wrestle with this message. Um, the science tells us there's still a there's still a pathway. And even if um, we go above two degrees, there's still potentially a way to bring that temperature back down. It's not it's not something we really want to. Um, rely on, but it potentially could happen. Um, if we, the, the problem with targets is, is I, I think people look at them and they go, oh, we're so close to two degrees, we can't do this. Um, perhaps we give up, you know, it's, there's no point. But I think the message has to be that we have to sort of keep our foot on the gas, um, so to speak. Um, and, and, <laughs> and, and, and not take the pressure off because landing at um, three degrees, two and a half degrees is a hell of a lot better than landing at four or five degrees. So the game's not over and that's what I, what I think we need to just remember. Um, but the other speakers spoke in a way that I think um, is more important and I think, I think what you know, Rod said is, you know, we can see the problem, we've talked about it, there seems to be no will, good will, to do that. And um, so maybe we need to be um, approaching this from a different way. Right, who else would like to? Um, there's lots we can do individually, um, but I think it, we often feel that that gets completely lost. So the, the simplest concept um, that I think helps, uh, that I talk about all the time, is that each of us can only do an infinitesimally small thing, but if an infinite number of us that do it, then that, that's a big effect. Um, so it's trying to get this kind of common understanding about what's going on, and, and therefore how we can act in, together in concert. You know, to do something. Um, and um, that's the essential thing that I, um, I think is really important to help people break through to, um, that they can make a, a, a difference, um, but it has to be in concert with others. Um, and the, the changes don't necessarily have to be dramatic, um, and they're often beneficial in one's own life to do that. 
Um, so, for example, um, active transport, sort of walking or cycling, um, or eating differently, um, those deliver wonderful benefits to you. Um, so you're not, you don't have to give up anything. Um, um, or if you are giving up something you cherish, you might find, um, and you can't imagine, you can't imagine living without, you find something else that you can live with very well, um, which is part of the solution. Sorry, I, I mean, I can then get listed, very involved in all the practicalities of this, but I, I'll just leave it at that for now. Thank you. I'll pass this to you. Good at Tato. Um, so I work a lot with um, communities in the north, my own communities, um, Ngāti Whātua Orake, which is in Auckland, um, but also Ngāti Manu and Te Hikatu, which is on either side of the um, north of the North Island. So uh, Ngāti Manu is in the Bay of Islands on the Taumariri River, and uh, Whirinaki, uh, or Te Hikatu, is in the Hokianga. And, um, you know, when you go there, you see that a lot of work is already being done by a lot of these communities, actually. Um, and they're working really hard um, to uh, drive uh, low carbon futures on marae in their own little communities. And I think a lot of people um, simply need to connect with the work that's already being done in our communities. Uh, and that's, that would be a really great start, that you don't have to do it alone, uh, that you just have to reach out and find the people that are already doing a lot of the work. Kia ora. Can I, can I add something? I'm not technically on the panel, but... I've got a really cool story and I really love talking. Okay, good, I'm going to. So um, a scientist like that, sort of a bit like Tim, um, a, a chap called Gary Wilson told me several years ago this a fantastic idea that he has and it's something that I would really love for you all to, I know he's got a couple of fantastic ideas um, that I'd love for everyone to spread far and wide. Um, and it's the idea of 2%, not 2 degrees, but 2%. So we are, um, the world is, is every year increasing its carbon footprint by about 2%. So if, as individuals, we can decrease our carbon footprint by 2%, which is not much, let's face it, um, every year, then actually we're going to do a, a heap of difference. And it's Rod's idea of, you know, take, every, every one of us takes one small step, but if all of us take those one small steps, it's a lot. So, 2% of your carbon footprint, if you think about that, um, you can do. Everyone can do 2%, it's easy. Uh, and then the next year you do another 2% on top of that, and as it goes. So it makes it a bit more manageable to us as, a, you know, as, as individuals. Um, I'm sorry to correct you, it was 2%, um, and it's now closer to 7 um, No, but, 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 yeah, but as long as, the longer we leave it, the bigger it gets. Um, so work on your 7% this year. Um, and, and don't count lockdown, that's cheating. I guess if you bike one day instead of drive, then that's 20% already if you work five days a week, so it's a good place to start. Um, let's see what questions we have. Why does New Zealand need an Antarctic research programme? John, I think that's you, and oh look, you've got the microphone. <laughs> well, so I think, uh, Antarctica really is, like, as we've all mentioned, is the kind of global thermostat. So if we want to understand what's going to happen to climate, we need to understand what's happening uh, in Antarctica. And, and usefully, it's actually the least affected by human habitation. So if we want to understand what you know, a pristine environment looks like, Antarctica is uh, really the, the place to go. And, and so I think you know, the work that Tim and others have done to really understand how those uh, ice sheets are behaving through time it's going to give us that crucial information for what is likely to happen in terms of the amount of sea level rise and how quickly that, that might happen. It's a panel discussion, not just a John discussion. I can keep talking. No? Okay, I'll ask the next question. Um, something that delighted me when I first met um, Dean Lawrence Kimberley three and a half years ago now, I guess, um, was, was we discussed climate change and what the church's stand, what the Anglican church's stand was on it and he said well you know the church believes in human induced climate change which is quite good when you work for a company that is researching climate change and so I guess the next question um, probably is focused on you Emily but how do we address that sort of suspicion around um, science communities and faith communities? Sure yeah 
Um, really important question, <laughs> um, and I don't actually I don't actually know the answer, um, but I think it, that it's crucial that we start talking about it because I think the suspicion goes both ways. Um, many Christians, particularly Christians who might identify as, as more kind of conservative or, or fundamentalist, um, profoundly distrust science um, and see it as kind of antithetical to Christian belief. I think that dynamic's probably a little bit more pronounced in places like America, but it's certainly present here in Aotearoa as well. I, I see it fairly frequently. Um, but also I think members of the science community can some be, sometimes be quite dismissive of um, the beliefs, religious beliefs of people of faith. Um, now obviously there's a lot of nuance in there as well. I don't think it's necessarily good to talk in extremes, but I think there's, there's huge potential there. Um, and so, um, Obviously, I think that people of faith um, need to engage with, with um, seriously with climate science. I mean, those kind of the statistics, Tim, that you were talking about, um, they're terrifying. They should utterly terrify us into, into change um, or inspire us into change. Um, but I also think that um, scientific communities often underestimate faith communities. Um, I was speaking at a conference in the UK last year in Lincoln. Rod was there too. Um, it was put on by the Diocese of Lincoln um, and the University of Lincoln. Um, and one of the speakers there at the conference was a professor, Mark McLean, I think his name was. Um, he was head of the School of Ge uh, Geography um, at the university there. He identified as an atheist, um, but he spoke about the need to ta for scientific communities to take religious communities seriously, particularly in the context of climate crisis. In, in terms of what he called pull power, um, so he talked about there being 5.5 billion people in the world who identify as belonging to a religious tradition. Um, that's a serious amount of kind of people power or pull power. Um, imagine if you could mobilize even half that number of people for radical climate action. Um, now, Professor McLean used the example of, of fossil fuel um, divestment, which a number of Anglican churches are already kind of committed to. So of that 5.5 billion people of faith, 2.4 billion are Christian. Um, and a theologian named Rosemary Radford Ruther argues that the vast majority of that 2.4 billion Christians in the world are far more likely to be um, persuaded of an ecological consciousness if they see that it grows from the soil in which they're already planted. 37% um, of New Zealanders identify as Christian, which is quite, well, it's a relatively, it's a shrinking number, but it's still a significant percentage of people and pull power. So I think there's huge potential, but also urgency <laughs> for these communities to kind of get together and start talking and working together. Um, and it also should be, I think, a wake up call for, for faith leaders to um, kind of step up and own kind of their role and responsibility um, in all this. Sorry, that was a really long-winded answer, but I feel really strongly about it. <laughs> Thank you, it was fantastic. Does anyone, anyone else have anything to say? Um, I just want to re retell one story. Um, um, em and I have a great friend in Auckland, uh, John Bishop, who's a very well-known uh, uh, theologian and, um, uh, and um, philosopher. And um, he was on a sabbatical at the University of Birmingham some years ago, just as the Higgs boson was about to be discovered. But what happened was um, he was invited down to CERN um, by the scientists at CERN. So it was a, ga a gathering of um, people from religion, philosophy, and science to talk about what were the new frontiers that they were collectively exploring. So what was the commonality between those three? Um, and I think that there is huge commonality um, as long as we respect the knowledge in each. Um, and. Um, and the sort of work that Em's doing on these uh, the, the sort of ecological interpretation in the Bible, and to understand how we can find there the third person in the Bible, so or the third actor. So it's not a bilateral relationship between humans and and God, um, but the planets in there as well. And when we start to see that, I think we start to. Um, uh, discover some in incredible truths about um, our relationship with the planet. And then, to me, that this is all absolutely one uh, with indigenous knowledge. And so, here in New Zealand, I, I think there is something quite wonderful starting to unfold around um, 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 Te Ao Māori and its embracing by um, 
more more widely, um, and that's why I think we in New Zealand have a particularly distinctive role um, in trying to bring these views together. Thank you. Um, we've only got five minutes le left, so I'll open it up to questions now from, there's a, a one here, and I'll take you next. Thank you. Um, Ruth Dix, I'm from the British High Commission, and I'm torn between asking a question as a mum or asking a question as a, as a diplomat, so maybe I'll just throw them both up, but really quickly, and you can choose. Um, so, um, I'm not a, a, a climate expert, and so I'm trying to think about this question about how do I bring climate into my world and the discourse in, in diplomacy and my side. Um, and I, one of the terms I hear quite a lot about, or increasingly, is climate security from the point of view that uh, climate is a risk multiplier or potentially a conflict multiplier because of migration, food security, some of the things you've mentioned already. And so I just, my professional question is, given we've talked a lot today about respect and love for the planet, I just wondered whether you thought that climate security discussion was helpful, unhelpful, is it a distraction, is it more about the symptoms than the cause, just a, a sense from you as to how helpful or unhelpful that climate security discussion is. And then as a mum, those of you who have kids, what are you teaching your kids to do differently that you didn't do as a child? Um, I'm holding on to this so I might speak into it. Um, yeah, that's, that's a really interesting question around the security um, issue. And before COVID, the World Economic Forum put out its, you know, its 10 major issues that could lead to e big economic crisis slash security crisis. And the t first five of them were all climate related. Um, in fact, pandemic didn't even feature in the, f in the top 10. And, and so that's, you know, hit us really um, from left field. And we always knew, knew the potential. Um, and I think, you know, there's plenty of examples um, around the world where institutions and governments recognise the importance of climate to, to global security. Um, I, I just, just make one comment. We've talked about people power and, and, and how, you know, people are galvanising around the world over many issues. It's great to see. And that's another thing I think gives us hope is um, you know, seeing the young people, seeing the Me Too movement, seeing um, Black Lives Matter, seeing the climate action with Greta Thunberg, there was a real sense that people were starting to get their voice back before COVID, dropped off a bit. Um, so I think, you know, I think Rod's right, we all need to do our bit, we do our 2% or 7%, Megan, we'll get there, but we're not gonna do that without good leadership, and we're not gonna do, and, and so it's absolutely critical that governments take take leadership in this. Um, New Zealand's leading the way, but we're a small country and we don't, honestly, will make a big difference apart from a moral one and a leadership one. And, um, you know, we don't need to, we don't need to talk much more about it. There's an opportunity to, um, to, to have an influence in New Zealand right now. But it's getting that global buy-in that if I don't, if we can't get global cooperation on this, and we, as I've said before, we've got some bad actors out there. Um, it, it, it really is a, a little bit depressing, but people power. I mean, I think, I think there's a lot to, to think about, and perhaps security is one of those issues that will motivate governments, whether it's food security, whatever. Yeah. And perhaps, Vic, do you want to talk about children? Sure. <laughs> Thanks, Megan. Um, I think it's. Uh, uh, I think I had a fortunate upbringing, and I was told to always tread lightly on the earth, and I'm carrying on that message with my daughter, but um, you know, we do it more consciously, you know, we talk about this kind of stuff and what we can do and just keep having that conversation and uh, allow my daughter to go to a climate change march with her school and have conversations about it afterwards and always just keep conversing. Um, but this is the rub, isn't it? So on one hand, we, we feel this sense of doom and we still have hope and we want to take personal action. On the other hand, we need really strong leadership and policy and urgent action from that space. And without that framework of policy um, to enable it to make it easy for us, like it has to be easy for us to make that change, otherwise we won't make it, um, then we're sort of stuck between that rock and the hard place. So. 
So um, a lot of it is down to, to policy and, and leadership and, and we need to think about how we um, make that policy change happen. But I do think New Zealand is in a very unique position and I think a strong thread has come through about kaitiakitanga and, um, and that, that uniqueness that we have here from that te ao perspective to really use that as the framework by which we uh, model to the rest of the world that we can take that on board, we can feel, and like I love this commentary from Rod and from uh, from others about that wairua, the, you know, the, the, the Māori, the, the, that connectivity that links all of us and everything together. And if we channel back into that community-led conversation, and that community-led a- action, and we all feel a sense of community, then I think there is a strong hope. And if that then propels governments to go, actually, we need to take this seriously and act with leadership, then we will be in a much stronger place. Thank you. Crucial, did you have something to say? Just, just quickly. Um, yeah, so I do think we need high-level conversations, the right kind of high-level conversations, Antarctic Treaty conversations, uh, global collaboration. But I think we also should remember that these are really simple questions, right, um, about how we live well together. And they, they cross over into not just climate security or climate justice, but social justice and global justice and environmental justice and all the different justices that we um, should remember, I think. Gender justice and all sorts of things. Thank you. Uh, we'll have one more question um, before we leave, so we'll be, keep this quick and hopefully a quick answer as well. Oh, thank you. Um, my sort of question is, uh, there's, there's lots of bad actors, as you said. I think some of the governments, some of the corporations, some of them are on the internet, and I think that um, there's a lot of you know, misinformation and so on. A lot of country needs to be done at multiple levels. And I guess my question is around you know, I mean, chatting in the cathedral is nice, and I'm glad I come along and listen to you. It's been great. But actually, there's got to be some pretty high-level um, interactions that, for some of those other bad players, if you see what I mean. And I just wonder. I really love your idea about all this money being spent that we've got a chance to restructure the economy. How are we doing that? I mean, what are we going to? Um, how are we going to address some of those big, deep issues? I'm actually going to pass this on to Rod because there's a. I mean, it, 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 it's a really good question. Um, there's a, climate, a New Zealand business climate conference happening quite soon. Um, quite soon, I think, in a month? Yeah, November the 11th, um, which Rod is probably largely hosting and organising. But the theme there is largely, um, and it's really New Zealand focused, of course, but as an example perhaps to the world, how do we regear, reset, and rebuild our, our society, um, our economy? Um, taking advantage of the fact that there is a lot of money to be spent and that if we do that right, we won't lock ourselves in to the way we've been doing things, but we have this opportunity to, to um, really change. And again, it's about leadership and how do you influence those other bad actors? It's way above my pay grade. Um, but I'll, did you want to add to that, Rod? Yes, thanks. Um, indeed, the um, Climate Change and Business Conference is in Auckland on November 11th and 12th, and I'm chairing it. Well, the other people are organising it. It's the Environmental Defence Society, um, but a, a very strong turnout from business. Um, it's incredibly hard because there are vested interests, there is inertia, um, there is um, all sorts of reasons that things aren't happening. Um, I, um, it is really, really important that um, we um, convey to everyone <laughs> that we can that the complexity of issues we're dealing with to these days, um, whether it's inequality, um, economic um, failure, um, environmental failure, social failures and all the rest, are deeply interconnected. And so we've got to find ways to work on these issues, not just targeting one and then another, um, but in ways that um, deliver multiple benefits. And, and all that is really clear, um, but it's really hard to um, get um, sufficient buy-in from um, um, government and politicians, I mean, even here in New Zealand. So um, I think three things um, that I think are important in how we might fast forward that. Um, the first one is that um, uh, 
um, the, 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 sorry, I, I'll try and keep it simple. The first one is um, to understand that we do have political agency. So I'm going to offer you another number, which is 3.5%. And that's the work of, that's come out of the work of Erica Chinoeth at ha Harvard University, looking at 100 years of pro social protest, um, violent and nonviolent. Um, and 3.5% is the, the proportion of a population you need to be actually out protesting, um, obviously with a message that has sufficient support from others who are not turned out. Um, and, um, and, and it's non-violent demonstrations of such of protests have proved far more effective than violent. So when we had the um, climate strike day in September last year, 3.7% um, of New Zealand's population turned out for that. It was our second largest day of protest in the country. Um, so, um, uh, and I think that th th there is some sort of momentum going there. I'll give you an example. Um, in June 2016, Generation Zero, who are my, some of my most favorite young people in the world, um, had a, um, launched in front of Parliament um, their campaign for a Zero Carbon Act. Nobody turned up. But by 2017, Labour had, had, had adopted this policy, and by November of 2019, we had a Zero Carbon Act. Um, so we can do these things. And so the last point is to come back to um, um, children and <laughs> what we tell them. Uh, I, I think to be able to um, excite in them this incredible sense of connection between us and other living things um, is one thing. Um, but then the other thing is to excite in them um, a sense of, of agency that together um, they can do things um, and help us, the rest of us, do things. And, um, but I have got to the point personally of uh, believing that um, non-violent um, civil disobedience um, is actually a perfectly leg legitimate tool and it's one that we should be now using um, because that's, we are at that stage. There, you heard it here in the Transitional Cathedral. Yep. What a fantastic evening. We've gone from uh, zero carbon to 2% or 7%. Um, carbon um, increase. We've talked uh, 65 metres of sea level rise and 4.7 kilometres of ice sitting on continents and um, what else is there? 70% of the world's fresh water caught up in Antarctica and all sorts of figures but the thing that has really impressed me about this panel is we have um, scientists of course and um, theologists and Christians and journalists and businessmen and uh, parents and um, indigenous representation and um, what an amazingly rich evening we lucky people have experienced because of these people up here. So thank you very much for bringing all your different perspectives. It's been um, really enlightening. From finding the right way to communicate and the right person to do it, a little bit depressing at times, but um, there is hope and we need to act now. Um, we need that emotional reaction you either love it or fear it, but only then will we open our minds to the actual information that the scientists are actually giving us. We need to rethink our relationships with each other and the natural world, that kaitiakatanga, that stewardship, enhance our relationships with people and the natural environment. It's important to continue Antarctic research because we need to learn more about the continent and what will happen in a changing environment from ice sheets to sea ice to ecosystems and how they will adapt in a, in a warming world. And finally, the Genesis 1, the disconnection between humans and Earth, which unfortunately I think we see all too much of, but the hope that's in Genesis 2, where we serve and nurture Earth, that we serve and preserve. So ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for the most incredible panel of climate change speakers I've heard. So thank you very much. Fantastic, and I'd also like to add my thanks to uh, Megan and to the panel. Thank you so much for being here tonight. I've learned a great deal and I've been stimulated and um, it's just been wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, there might be a cup of tea just down at the hatch down there if you want to mill around a little bit and um, enjoy some time together. And if your panellists don't go away, I've got a wee thank you card and a gift. Thank you very much, very much everyone.